and now we are live. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to see you on our new workshop. And please meet our brilliant guest uh, today, Glenn and Freddy. Today we will speak about a very important topic, the diversity heaven. Everybody knows that diversity is must have, and diversity is very important. But nobody told us how to hire, how to support diversity talent, diverse talents. So today we will share our own experience. If you are interested in the experience of Matcher, you can read after the workshop, of course, our article. Just click on the button, article, how to find female engineers. Uh, in this article, we have shared our own experience in uh, diversity hiring, but today I'm really excited to listen to Glenn's and Ted's experience because they are very great professionals in that. So today we will have a very good workshop on on, on uh, diversity, diversity hiring, and uh, Glenn and Teddy will share their tips on how to find female engineers online. Guys, all the stage for you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Hi everyone, uh, really nice to see so many participants. Um, it's uh, actually an absolute honor to be on uh, the same webinar together with, uh, with Glenn. Um, we are going to uh, share some uh, experiences. Uh, from my side, I will tell you um, a couple of uh, interesting cases that I've worked on in the past. And I think Glenn is going to help me with very hands-on how-to examples, uh, complementing also uh, my experiences. Um, Glenn, would you like to introduce yourself? Not really, but... No? <laughs> I, 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 you could just read there. I've been doing sourcing for over 20 years now. So if if you don't know me, then I don't know what you've been doing Everybody in sourcing. Knows, yes. yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, well, as Glenn said, if you don't know who he is, then uh, you totally have to do your homework next time. Um, I am a baby compared to him. Um, whose dog is that? Glenn, do you have a dog? Sorry, I, I yeah. Please mute me while you're speaking. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. Can uh, can your dog can uh, come into picture later on to say hi? Um, so then a little bit about me. I am a baby uh, in in sourcing compared to to Glenn. Um, I'm originally Bulgarian, but I've been working for the past years in the Netherlands as a people and culture advisor. I do mainly tech recruitment, uh, quite a lot of sourcing. Uh, but I also advise startups and scale-ups on um, anything connected to people and culture. And for some of you that have worked or work in startups, you know, you go in there with one job and you end, end up having five jobs. So you probably feel me and you know how it is. Um, working throughout the past years in various startups and scale-ups here in the Netherlands and also a couple of them abroad, I have uh, came to uh, the conclusion that you all probably have heard, um, you would hear from your hiring managers, we need more women in, uh, in our tech teams, uh, go figure it out. Um, a lot of people don't know where to start. Uh, those female developers are quite a big myth so um, let's take a look a little bit at uh, what is out there and, and how can we find uh, some uh, female developers. I want to start with saying that uh, for me, and I guess for a lot of you, diversity doesn't mean necessarily only the ratio between men and women in a company, right? That's not the only diversity out there. There is so much more behind it, but I, I, I want to talk at least for now about uh, sourcing female developers because this is already a very complex theme. So um, I do believe that a lot of the approaches that I, I will show you and Glenn will talk about are absolutely applicable, not only for uh, gender diversity. 
So the first time when I was actually uh, approached by a hiring manager uh, for a diversity role was literally, hey, Teddy, we need a female CPO that is between 30 and 35 years old, comes from the US, uh, preferably Silicon Valley, has a startup and scale up experience, preferably in the bread and fashion industry, would like to relocate to Amsterdam and doesn't want to earn more than 100K. Um, do I have to tell you that this is not a unicorn or a purple squirrel, but this is like very close to impossible. Um, I, I laughed uh, at the face of the hiring manager and I said, good luck, but uh, this is of course not how things work. So I ended up doing quite a lot of work in order to find uh, that uh, female CPO. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how I did that. So I've always, when, whenever I would approach a new role that I've never sourced for before, or um, I never, uh, or I sourced for, but it was already a long time ago, I would always uh, take a certain approach, certain steps uh, in order to have a very structured uh, way of doing it, but also to be able to take out the learnings and continue working uh, with those learnings. So let's take a look at uh, the first step, which is the challenge. Um, Glenn, if you can uh, squeeze that in into the next slide. Thank you. And one more. Cool. Okay. So um, as I said, back then I was looking for a female CPO. Uh, but I've decided to talk with you about um, a more recent, um, hey, Leandro, welcome. <laughs> I've decided to talk to something that is more relevant, something that I've done for a client of mine uh, just last summer. I was looking for full stack web developers, female ones, uh, with a certain stack. So we're talking here about six plus years of experience in a startup or a scale up. Um, someone who works with JavaScript and Node.js, age discrimination in asking for 30, 35 years old. Hell yeah, Mathieu, yeah. Go explain that, by the way. But that was not the only discrimination that was going on over there. Anyways, um, in terms of uh, that female developer that I was looking for, it was six of them. Um, they didn't only have to work with very specific a technology stack, but they had to be in a certain time zone from plus six GMT to minus six GMT. They had to all be able to work remote uh, and not need a visa and so on and so on. And I can tell you folks, this was such a big challenge because I've never worked with time zones before. Um, I never hired someone remote, and I do know what are the requirements for visa here in the Netherlands, but I don't know them in other countries. So for me, that that was a lot of figuring out going on. Um, I see that there are around 1,500 people uh, who are currently listening to us. Um, that's quite nice. It's very exciting to me. Uh, but uh, I can imagine that some of you are non-tech recruiters. Some of the things that I'm going to talk about are uh, tech related, but don't worry about it because uh, you can also use that knowledge into also non-tech related uh, roles. Okay, I think we can go to the uh, next slide. So uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the approach and then um, the approach in the sense of not how to write the Boolean string, but how to think strategically as a sourcer when you approach such a, a difficult challenge like sourcing for diversity. Um, can we have the next slide? Thanks. Okay, so there are four steps of the structured and successful sourcer who approaches a new challenge, or at least this is how I work feel free to take uh, some of the things uh, that, that you like. So first of all, I always will do my research. In, in my case, and I'm very curious also to hear Glenn's opinion here, uh, research is always a part of sourcing. It's actually <laughs> the biggest part of sourcing is researching. Uh, but for me, it starts at the moment when I write literally 
where to find female developers on Google. And I did write it. And the first results that I would get was um, very interesting statistic and articles from Stack Overflow and DevSkillers where they were talking about where you can find a lot of female developers, uh, what, are, uh, what are the technologies that they're usually working with and everything, which is already a very good start point. Then I would take a look at meetup.com because this is a place where you have a lot of big groups of female developers, uh, like Code Girls, for example, in the Netherlands. Um, I think in the US, there are also quite a lot of them, right, Glenn? Do you know? Yeah? Okay, cool. And in Brazil, for example, I found a huge um, um, meetup group with uh, a lot of female developers. So those are already places where you can learn a lot. I'm not even talking about sourcing yet. Next to that, LinkedIn universities was something that was quite useful because on LinkedIn, in the universities, you can look for um, alumni. And if you read those Stack Overflow and DevSkillers reports, they will tell you that, for example, countries like Romania or Ukraine have high saturation of female developers in comparison with other countries. So if you go into the technical universities in Cluj-Napoca in Romania, for example, or in Kiev in uh, Ukraine, you'll see that a lot of their alumni is also female. So this is a great place to learn also a lot about it. Um, I use my own network. I have a couple of female developers in my network. I talked with them. I asked them, where do you girls hang out? Where is a safe place for me to learn more about your needs? And what are you looking for in next challenges? And then the ladies told me a lot about women in tech organizations, like, for example, Anita B. It's the biggest one. I think that last year during the conference in New York, uh, Grace Hopper celebration, they had a little bit more than 10,000 female developers from all over the world. God, if you can source over there, can you imagine? Like you don't need LinkedIn or anything else. So this is the research part. Uh, Glenn, do you do you do some research when you when you get a, a role like this? Or what do you do? Let's see if we can unmute you. Yes. Great. Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of research methods that uh, I would be leveraging, and we can talk about a few of those here, and we'll yeah. come back to your slide. Um, Absolutely. So the, the one that will lend itself very well to LinkedIn and a lot of other sites um, if you're trying to find names is just popular names. Uh, and I'm talking about the given names, first names, which yeah. depending on the geography that you're searching, um, you would use different lists. And so that's why I think it's very important to go to the equivalent of the um, US Social Security Administration where they keep track of all the most popular girls' names by year. So you can go back, say, 25, 30 years and find the most popular girls' names at that time. And then those are the women today um, in those geographies. So I have given you um, a list that you'll see when you um, click the link in the presentation that you'll be getting later. I think this is linking to my Google Sheet that you'll all have access to. So you can download this and you'll see that there are very comprehensive lists that are Boolean ready that you can literally copy and paste right into a LinkedIn search for Chinese girls' names, India girls' names, Polish girls' names, Taiwanese, US, and so on. And the thing that's good to remember is I wouldn't just use, say, an India girl name list for India in country searches. You can also go to places around the world where there's a large Indian descent population. Um, so in the US, San Francisco, for example, is, is a good one there. So this kind of search can also be very effective um, in other geographies besides the obvious country. I think uh, what, uh, what, what is really cool over here is that uh, Glenn actually has an Excel sheet with that. And I actually manually was writing 
those female names in my searches, which was a complete nightmare. So thanks, Glenn, for making this sheet. Absolutely. Um, and if you have a free search, you're going to have to probably cut those down a bit. So I've grouped them in smaller chunks because um, you can only do probably about 30 keywords in a free LinkedIn search, whereas you can do hundreds on LinkedIn Recruiter. So if you do have the more expensive license, uh, you can get more done at once with that. But even if you don't want to use either of those, uh, the site search, um, some people call it X-Ray, where you go on Google and you type site colon in front of linkedin.com slash in, which limits you to just individual people profiles. Uh, you could put names in that kind of search or what I'm recommending in this bullet that I'm mousing over here, um, the pronouns, she or her, work really well. Uh, and you can put that after that kind of search and you will often find uh, women profiles on LinkedIn. Of course, you would add other keywords after that related to software development or locations. Uh, we'll get back to other things related to LinkedIn, but I, I did want to jump into Google Images, which I think is a great way to search. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how to do that because um, Google Images um, used to make this super simple. It was on the image search. Now you have to go to the advanced image search to find this option. So if I were going to do a search for she or her, for example, then I can use this any of these words field and just type she, her, and it knows to put the Boolean or in between. And then here's the important part. Down here in this lower section, it says type of image. You have to change this from any type to face. And once you do that and run the search, now you're only going to get images of faces and somewhere on there is going to be the word she or her. And you can see pretty much everything I'm getting is a female face. So now we want, of course, make this a little more narrow. So this is where I would add other things related to the skill, right? So if I know that I'm looking for a software developer, then I could certainly just type the phrase software developer. In quotes, we'll force it to be exactly that. And you can see. I'm still getting a really clean list of women and they're probably all software developers or that, those words wouldn't be on there. And of course you can go even further and say, all right, I just wanna see people that maybe reference a particular skill set." So everyone's talking about containerization these days. So you probably know things like Kubernetes or Docker or something like that. So you can add that kind of thing. And now I'm getting just two software developers that know these container technologies. So you can see how I can keep getting narrower and narrower, but I've still got hundreds of people I could be going through here. The pretty cool thing here is that uh, I think you could do that, for example, with uh, uh, with Twitter and with podcasts and all those kind of things, right? Because you can still do Google image search, but then for a certain um, website. Absolutely. So I did put an example here in the next bullet of using medium.com because a lot of techies right. do write articles there. But I like your idea of trying it, say, against Twitter. You could do that. So I'm going to do a site colon Twitter in front of that. Um, it looks like the results are not quite as clean here. Um, so we'd have to do some digging as to why that probably is the case. Uh, but yeah. since our goal is probably to see individual candidates and their profiles and maybe even resumes, I would pick a site that's more specific to dev. Uh, so some of you may be familiar with dev.to. Um, that's a site where it's just techies. So this I'm pretty confident I'm going to be seeing just developers in these results. And that looks yeah. pretty good. Uh, but yeah, I like your idea of that direction of whatever site you want to try, just put site colon in front of that domain and that could be part of the search. Yeah. 
or maybe even GitHub. Although a lot of developers tend to not put information in their GitHub profiles, I have noticed that female developers tend to add more information than, uh, than men. So you might also score a profile or two over there as well. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and I would also say, let's not be uh, too strict about the pronouns because these days not everyone is using those she or her pronouns or whatever Absolutely. it is in yeah. your language. Um, so I've been trying things like gender asterisk female, which of course means there's more one or more words in between, um, mm -hmm. gender fluid, lesbian, non-binary, these all typically find uh, women results as well. Yeah, and you know what? what is another interesting approach is if you would have a textio or, or a tool like this that um, would sense if a word is more on the ma male side or more on the female side, you can actually pick up some uh, more feminine words that typically are coming in uh, in descriptions of profiles and, and try to use that. Of course, that would give you a lot of results, but it's just a nice way to um, make your searches a little bit, I don't know, funnier than, uh, than the usual strict one. I'm with you there. Um, there are um, Google custom search engines that um, have been created that have some of this logic built in. So if mm. I knew that I was only looking for engineers or developers who are diverse, I could actually type that phrase and you'll see on this result, this is uh, by the way, by Irina Shamieva, who I think a lot of you know, um, you can see there's tabs across the top here for LGBT and Asian and African American, but of course we're talking about women today. So I'm gonna click that refinement tab and you can see that it brings me only women results and that's because she's built a lot of the logic that we're talking about in the back end of the search engine. So all you have to worry about is skill terms, possibly location terms would be good to add. I could throw Amsterdam at the top of this as well. Um, and that's gonna help narrow it down a little bit. Yeah, Not perfect. that's pretty but. amazing. For, for some of you that don't know what custom search engines are, um, I think that for the, the easiest way to explain it, and I am no professional in that, and I, I am actually a little bit scared from the CSEs. Um, basically, when you do a Boolean search in Google, you have a limitation of 32 words, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Yeah, so then if you want to use that whole name suggestion what just glenn gave you you're going to be limited to 32 words and then you have to run a lot of different searches what irina in this case did is she built a tool that has all those names in there all that logic so you don't have the limitations of it anymore did i explain it a little you bit did great. And it's, it's actually not as hard as you might think to build these custom search engines. Uh, there's some free how to's on the internet. Just I would Google something like uh, how to uh, create a Google custom search engine. And Irina and her um, business partner, David Galley, are actually about to come out with a book on creating Google custom search engines. So definitely keep an eye out for that. That's great. I'm definitely going to buy that book. Yeah. Uh, let's jump into a slightly different direction, which is targeting the women-focused organizations. So you mentioned um, Anita be, or Grace yeah. Hopper. Um, that conference is great. Um, so Anita B is the, I guess you'd call it the, the nickname for that organization. It's the domain name also, anitab.org. Yeah. So you can search for that as a keyword. Uh, the Women in Technology International Group, WITI is another good one, Women Who Code. There are tons of these out there. And using that as a keyword, I think, is very effective. And you can uh, use that. You can use um, names of universities that admit only women or mostly women. The US has about 30 of those. Uh, there's also a list of uh, university fraternities. These are the college organizations that are geared to 
women or minorities. Um, so there's a list of those uh, that I found by a gentleman named Jonathan Kidder, whose blog is really good, by the way, on anything sourcing related, uh, wizardsourcer.com, you should go there. But this particular article that you'll see linked in the um, deck that you're gonna receive has the list of all of these different female fraternal organizations. So you know if anyone puts uh, one of these societies on their profile or resume, you're probably looking at a woman. Uh, so it's, it's yeah. another way to limit your search. I think it's also pretty cool that if you would be, um, for example, monitoring Twitter when one of those events is happening, for example, Anita B. Grace Hopper celebration happens once in a year and it's massive, it's huge. There are women from all over the world going over there. They flood Twitter with hashtag. If you would follow that, you can even source them from Twitter only following the Anita B. hashtag. That's great. Yeah, I'm glad you, you mentioned that earlier. I think I was muted, but I went to the one in 2018 uh, okay. and there were the US version. There were 20,000 women from around the world at that oh one. God. But that's not the only one. They've gotten so big that they now have one based in India every year, which is almost as large as the US one and probably attracts a greater percentage of Asian talent. So if that's yeah. your target, I would I would probably go look at that event. That's quite incredible. But it's it's a massive event, 20,000 people. Yeah, that's they pull incredible. out all the stops. I mean, if you're looking for free giveaways, these they the company spend so much <laughs> at yeah. that event to attract that talent. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Let me show you another fun one that I like to use. Um, Irina turned me on to this method as well. It's, it's the image for search. And the reason that this works so well is because when you're looking at LinkedIn profiles, what LinkedIn likes to do is they have the logo for the organization showing on the person's page and the way it works in terms of Google index of those pages, there's that text behind the image that gets uh, grabbed as well. So what I'm really doing is searching for the alt tag in the HTML and it's gonna find that somewhere on the page. So if I were to go to this particular person's profile, I'm probably gonna see, you know, why is it not taking me right to her profile? You love these live things where it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. <laughs> yeah, that should it should be going direct to her profile. Um, we'll have to take a look at that because it definitely was the right page that we were trying to see there. Um, so this method here of site colon LinkedIn dot com slash in and then put image for women in quotes and then you can follow it with some of those job titles or other technical terms. And there's a slightly different version of that search where you're going to put an asterisk in between for women. And what that's going to do is it'll look for, and you'll see this a little better when I go to the search result. So you can see it says image for Amazon women in engineering. See, I don't know what this word is in between image for and women, but that's what the asterisk key does for you on Google. It's a placeholder for one or more words. So it doesn't matter almost what the words are in between. The point is it's going to find those. So you can see here image for high tech women, um, yeah. image for Israeli women in STEM. All of them are good, right? So that way I'm catching everything with that wild card character. That's quite amazing. <laughs> Pretty awesome. And uh, here on the right-hand side, um, I would say also consider joining some of these organizations. Everyone thinks, oh, it costs a lot to recruit at the Grace Hopper Conference. Yes, it does. But there's nothing stopping you from joining exactly. the organizations that support them. And particularly during COVID, I'm finding that membership fees, if there were any, are often waived. So you can probably join most groups for free, and then you have more ability to search uh, their members. Yeah. And if, 
and actually if if i may add here especially in europe if you're in europe if you're in in central europe or actually it doesn't matter where if you're in europe organizations like anita b are starting to to come over here you know they have a strong chapter in london for example but in the netherlands in germany in france they don't have anything set up and they're looking for people and companies that are going to help their organization grow here for free you know like you can just initiate starting hosting them and whatever and they have budgets and it's truly amazing i uh, actually worked with a couple of ladies from anita b and it's it's really worth it one of my biggest takeaways is before you can expect something from the community you have to invest in there absolutely uh, another thing you can do if you're not able to join the organization for some reason is you can still leverage search engines uh, because they've indexed a lot of these pages. They somehow get through on a lot of these sites. So I will typically put in title colon, meaning I'm willing to just search the title of the web page for things like bio or CV or resume or member or roster. And that's a very effective search uh, string to put at the beginning of any query. So I could follow this with either the name of an organization, the name of a company, uh, she or her, the pronouns, and you will be amazed at what you can find. So I did this uh, with women in technology as the phrase after that. And, you know, here you go getting lists of the people that, you know, belong to these groups. Uh, it's just a really neat way to search that I think most people don't think about. Yes. Absolutely. So you did talk about how uh, Meetup and some of the other organizations in E2B are moving to other parts of the world. Uh, I think that's certainly very important. And when you're doing that search, this is when you really should be thinking about the native language of the place you're searching. So we often default to English as our way to search because we think it's an international business language. but Let's face it, people are more comfortable writing their profiles or their CVs in their native language. So if you want to be able to find that information online, you need to be thinking about the equivalent terms in the native language. So when I'm searching for, say, uh, French uh, people, I'm going to want to look at words for women in French. Um, obviously, there's femme. There's also certain job titles that there are Absolutely. feminine versions of the word. Uh, developer is a good one, right? So there's developus uh, in French, which is different than developeur, which is the one for, it's a masculine one that's used by both. But if anyone's going to list developus, well, then we're pretty sure we're talking about a women developer. Yeah, absolutely. And this is uh, actually Google Translate is your best friend whenever you go to source in a different country. Uh, I got quite stuck in sourcing female developers in Brazil at some point. And then I found out how you call developers in, in Portuguese. And then I actually improved my searches and, and used those words in there and got some pretty good stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's excellent. Um, I mean, you could, here's a good example, right? If I were searching LinkedIn France, so again, I'm using the FR uh, subdomain prefix in my site search. So it's not just all of LinkedIn. I only want to see the FR subdomain ones, which will be French profiles. And I'm putting that word femme that I mentioned earlier, along with my normal technical terms, which tend to be more in English. But you can see my results here are profiles all written in French. But that's OK, uh, because I want these people. Uh, they obviously know what I'm talking about when for whatever I was searching on. And when you do these kinds of searches, many times you will come across a really long list of names, uh, much like the women in technology one I was showing you earlier. So when you find those things, you should scrape them. So we don't have time today to talk about web scraping, but I think it has been touched on in other parts of the Match HR series. Um, a matcher, um, I forget who presented, but 
whatever you use as a scraping tool, and there are some very simple ones out there, what it will allow you to do is pull all of the people information on whatever website you're on into an Excel compatible format, usually a .csv comma separated values. And once you have that file downloaded, then what you can do is use a tool like Gender API. And what I like about this tool, which is free up to a certain number of names. So if you have, I think it's 500 names, it's free. Um, and what it will do is it'll take your list and it'll tell you which ones are female out of your list. So if you get a, even a big generic list from a conference that may have a mix of men and women, if you want to quickly know which ones are the women, you could run this on that list. Uh, it works in it, your Excel file, it works in Google Sheets, and it'll tell you, much like you're seeing here on the screen, it gives you an accuracy percentage for each name. And the reason that that can vary is, of course, some names are a little more gender neutral. So here in the United States, for example, Sam can be short for Samuel or Samantha. So yeah. we have uh, potentially women or men. So that would probably have a lower accuracy score. But the other interesting thing is it will also keep in mind what country the person is from. So if you download a list and you know uh, which country the names are from, it's a smart enough tool to realize that the name Jean, which is how you pronounce it in English, J-E-A-N. Now, of course, in French, we pronounce that Jean. And Jean in the U.S. is a female name, but Jean in France is a male name. So when it sees that name, but it knows that it's French, because you're in your list that you download, you can put the country, then it will give that a high confidence score for male. But if that name were a U.S. name, it would realize it was female. So it's a pretty smart tool in that regard. And um, again, a great way to genderize your big lists yeah. uh, quickly. Yeah, I think that there are definitely countries where it's going to work uh, better than others. I have quite a lot, I've had quite a lot of challenges with uh, sourcing female developers in Israel. Uh, if you, Israel and Egypt are perfect for sourcing female developers. Really, you're going to have a very high hit ratio. But uh, in the beginning, especially in Israel, it was so difficult because words like um, the, some names, you, you, you don't know if it's a girl or a boy. So it's, uh, it's quite funny. I've learned a lot. Yeah, and there are also free tools for just a single name search. Uh, usually mm -hmm. they call it gender baby name guesser. Yeah. Uh, there are a bunch of sites like that where you just type in the name and it will tell you a confidence rating on, on gender for that name and location. Um, all right, let me show you one more thing and then we'll get back to uh, Teddy's interesting uh, project that she was sourcing on. So one thing I like to use is called the three plus name method. I coined this term about a 15 years ago when I was working with Shally. And the idea behind this is that if you have three or more things that are very similar, whenever you search for that, it's going to find pages that have not just those three words on it, but anything related to it. Because it's typically going to be on a page with a big long list of similar stuff. So for example, if I knew that three people all worked at the same company, I would put those three names in a Google search and it would probably find me names of other employees at that company. Or if I put three names of women diversity organizations in tech, I would probably find pages that had lists of even more women diversity organizations in tech. So it's a great way to build out a list of related things when you know a few and you just wanna find more things like it. So I'll show you a simple example of how we might do that. So let's take three people that all work in sourcing, right? So there's me, there's Shally, there's, I don't know, who else do we know from a long time ago? Arena. Glenn, Kathy, yeah. Arena, there you go. That's a good one, let's put Arena. So you have to think to yourself, okay, if I were to Google those three names, what pages would have all three names on it? 
and what else would be on there. So you can see among the very first results is a page for a sourcing conference, right? Well, that makes sense because the three of us were all speakers at that conference. And now I'm going to see yet more sourcing speakers, which is great because I want related people. Um, here's a Quora article. Someone said, who are the online sourcing experts? Perfect, right? I want to find more people like that. So try that kind of search for whatever three things you know. Uh, I also use this a lot with competitors. So if I, I currently work in banking, so there are certain companies that I know I'm very interested in. So if I type those company names one after the other, and then I, let's see, what do we do? And of course you don't have to stop at three, right? You could do four. So if you knew four companies that were all closely related, and then you run a search, what else does it find? So if I scroll down, you're gonna see here, uh, I've got government lists that relate to banking, which makes sense because we're all banks. So we'd be on those kinds of lists. Um, looks like a jobs page with a whole bunch of uh, companies that have those kinds of jobs and so on. So that all makes sense. Um, and again, using it with the women diversity organizations uh, is a really great way to find yet more women diversity organizations. And last but not That's least, I want to show you this Chrome extension. It's called Native Current. So if you've never heard of this before, don't worry. It's not that popular yet, but I hope it will be. And the idea behind it is that it's going to suggest things that you can search on. So let's see if I can show you how this works here. Let's go back to Google, I guess. That probably would make sense. And here I am, and I'm trying to do some searching. And what I really want to do here is see what other. OK, oh, that's right, because it doesn't think I'm signed in on this machine. I love the things that happen when you do a live demo. Oh, okay. yeah. So while we are logging in, uh, I don't know if you guys noticed, but some of the uh, words uh, on Glenn's screen were highlighted. Some of sourcing was in yellow. There was something about sourcer was in orange. This is a fantastic tool called uh, Multi Highlighter. It's a free Chrome extension, and it's very useful when you're uh, sourcing. So basically what you do when you download the Chrome extension, um, you, you have it close to your tabs and then you open it and you put some keywords in there. Uh, imagine that you're uh, sourcing for a sourcer or a developer, you put all the keywords over there that are important for the certain job, like this one, exactly. And then whenever those words appear on the profile or on the page where you are, you can screen it so much faster. I absolutely love it. I don't know why it's not making this part bigger, but yeah, basically whatever words you type uh, under the pop-up for this extension, it always highlights it uh, anywhere on the page, which as you say, is a really... Um, it saves a lot of time. Big time saver, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think we have around two, three more minutes uh, before the Q&A starts. Um, we actually had a lot more prepared for you guys. Uh, oh, but yeah, that's the, that's uh, the time. Um, I think that uh, the most important thing is to try out different things. Glenn just showed you so many different tricks. There is so much learnings to get out of that. And the most important thing is to, to put those learnings together and to optimize. So if you see that one thing works really great and another thing doesn't work that great, then um, it's called multi-highlighter. I will try to find the link for you in a second. I will post it in the, uh, in the, in the chat box. Um, basically, there are a lot of learnings here. You know, um, I've been working on that project for six months, I think, and then um, I knew which countries I should be sourcing in. I knew that Brazil, Egypt, uh, South Africa, um 
there were other countries like, uh, for example, uh, Italy or, or Spain that were not that successful in my searches. So um, once you do, what I usually try to do is I do two week sprints. I'm trying to, that agile methodology, two week sprints, I'm trying out some things. And then after two weeks, I come back, I sit down and I'm like, okay, what did work well, what not? I analyze it, I take out my learnings and then I optimize, which means that I'm using the things that worked well and then I put some extra sprinkles on top of it. Um, I would say there are a lot of platforms and tools that you can use for that. Um, some of them are for free others are paid i think that everything what glenn showed you is for free so you don't have the excuse for not having the budget for it um don't have the excuse for time as well because even if you do this for half an hour every day if you source for two hours and you invest half of it into uh, diversity sourcing you will definitely see the results in your pipeline and there is so much more to talk about about locations about uh, what I also said, um, all the different Anita B organizations and stuff like that are places that you can, as a company, contribute to and then expect to get a lot back if you do so. So think about that and, and enjoy the process, uh, enjoy the small wins. I remember how um, I wrote a message to an Israeli a developer, a, a beautiful lady, and I made a joke and she was like, did you actually notice that I was working for the uh, Israeli government? I was like, does she, does she mean like, you know, the Mossad thing? So I was scared for a while, but you know, it's what we're doing sometimes can be very repetitive work, but there are always small things that are gonna light up your day. And I'm sure that if you try a lot of the things that Glenn just showed you, you're going to have enough variety in your work not to find it boring. So yeah, that's it from my side. Any uh, closing words from you, Glenn, before we do the q and I think we're not gonna go through the rest of the slides. No, we won't have time, but I, I do have some things in the appendix that I think you'll enjoy. So do click those links when you receive the slides and I think they'll be self-explanatory. So yeah, let's go to questions. Shoot. We have a question about uh, which extensions can be used in India for diversity sourcing? I believe the same as all over the world, actually. Right, there's no geographic restriction to using them. It's just that some tools were created with the United States in mind, so the yeah. results will probably be better. But I would say in general, uh, most tools are very good with English language data. So mm -hmm. since India does have a high percentage of English language speakers and they're putting their content out onto the internet in English, it should be discoverable by those tools. Now, if they're writing things in Hindi, that's different, right? Mm -hmm. That language is not as uh, well indexed, but um, if you, as long as it, it, it um, as, Teddy said earlier, if you use tools like Google Translate to figure out what the equivalents are in those languages and you include that in your search string, and there's nothing wrong, by the way, with mixing English and native language terms in the same search string. Just put the Boolean or in between each pair of keywords and it works just fine. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And mm -hmm. what are some tips on uh, job description? So if you make a job description, uh, yeah. How could we adapt it for for female search, for example? Okay, so um, my the first thing that comes to my mind if you're talking about creating the job description uh, is uh, to use language that is female friendly. Uh, there are a lot of research is done on that. I think Textio is one of the tools that literally, if you copy and paste your job description, it will show you. Uh, percentage of how feminine or masculine mm -hmm. it sounds. It will give you suggestions about where you can improve, but Textio does cost money. I think there was another tool that you can use that was similar to Textio, but I don't remember it. You mean well, Textio, the good news, right? I'm gonna share it. 
yeah, yeah. do that. And, and that brings up another good search method. So when you know one company, you don't know three, so you can't use my three plus method. But if you type that at, with the word competitor after it, so I would type Textio competitor, um, yeah. you will find other companies uh, that okay. offer a similar service. Thank you, Matthew. That was the one that I was looking for, the gender decoder. That was great. OK, cool. Thanks. Yeah, I have also heard that we should avoid some masculine terms and words like we are looking for ninja, guru, I don't know, jetty, something like that. And we have to be more neutral when we write job descriptions, you know, that girls and women wouldn't feel that this is not for them and this is only for, for, for males. My suggestion is always to start internally. So if you already have a female developer uh, or a female tech uh, or product, because also uh, product and design are considered more uh, technical than uh, someone who would work in HR, write your job description and go to that uh, woman and say like, okay, listen, this is the first time when, I'm, when we're writing a job description, we want to be more sensitive towards our applicants, we want to uh, be gender neutral or inclusive or whatever, what do you think? And then you get a free advice. And if you don't have it, post it on LinkedIn and say, Dear ladies out there, we need your feedback. What do you think about our job description? Because we want to include you. We want you to feel welcomed in our company. Do you think that this job description is uh, is doing that for you? You don't know how much positive reactions you can get on that. And it's again for free. It's super great, super great growth hacks, I would say. I, I would never think about it, but yeah i think it's 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 really great idea to ask community to ask uh, people from your surroundings yeah you don't and have to invent everything in your heart you have yeah, to ask exactly and and i throughout the years i've heard a lot of times that um a lot of limitations you know like oh we don't have the budget or we don't have the time we don't have this we don't have that this is limitations that you put in your head. There is nothing impossible. You just haven't found a creative way to solve it yet. So try to break out of those chains, use all the information that we just gave you. And also don't be afraid to reach out and ask for advice. Mm -hmm. um, this is just amazing. And you know what? Female developers really appreciate when you're open and vulnerable and you ask for help because they feel appreciated when you want to listen to them. Yeah, absolutely agree. And it's and only great, advice great advices. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions more. If you open ask a question, you will see it. What other, what about other types of diversity sourcing, mm -hmm. such as neurodiversity? What is that? I have no idea. Yeah, neurodiversity is a great topic because you're talking about the invisible forms of diversity, such as people with autism or who are mm. in, introverted versus extroverted. So you definitely want to have that kind of diversity represented in your organization, because we know from lots of studies that the companies that are most successful in their space have a wide range of diversity on their staff as well as their executive leadership and you just make better business decisions when you have that on your team yeah yeah and um the the other thing is for example um i have to say there was um a tool on uh, i think i've deleted it Glenn, what is that tool that you can use on LinkedIn? Uh, Cynthia? No, it was a female name, I think, but it, it would give you an information about the uh, emotional intelligence and the type of a person uh, that uh, the, the profile is. So, yeah. Crystal knows. Thank it, you. Yeah. Yes, yes, this is it. It's, it's amazing. It's paid, but it's a great way to also um, 
you know, one of the challenges that I've seen, especially in startups, is the fact that they're higher on cultural fit. And very often the cultural fit is no diversity. It's like-minded people with the same background, with the same ideas, absolute lack of diversity. So this is a great way by, for example, using Crystal Knows and, and analyzing the type of people that are in the team to add diversity based on uh, or their personality colors or their backgrounds or anything like this. I just threw in a link to a presentation that uh, Glenn Caffey, who I think a lot of you know, longtime sourcing leader, presented for my Boston area talent sourcing association. It was on neurodiversity for uh, talent sourcing and recruiting. Really well researched. You can download the presentation for free. Uh, it's not that old. Uh, all of the info in there is really strong. So. If that topic interests you, take a look. Awesome, yeah. And we have a question from Engel Decker, who is asking, what's the strategic preference in sourcing locations, location by location or multiple at the same time? I guess you know what it is. I've tried it with very broad searches, but in the end, I ended up narrowing it down per countries and per cities. And for me, the cities were very important because I've actually researched in the Eastern European countries where I know that there are a lot of female developers. I've researched what are the best tech universities and I was sourcing based on those universities and, and those locations. And this is, this is really something that works really great because if you throw a very open search, you're gonna have what, a couple of million users um, that you have to go through or maybe 100. On, on LinkedIn, you have a limitation of 100 pages anyway. So I think that local location, for me, at least it has worked great. What about yeah, you? You're, you're pointing to a topic uh, often referred to as market mapping, and you're trying yeah. to do a gap analysis where you're trying to understand, okay, if I'm looking for a certain type of talent, obviously I would prefer the people who are already located near one of my company's offices. But yeah. the question is, where else is there a high concentration of that talent that I'm not necessarily thinking about? Because it may be more cost effective to source in that location. And there are a number of tools out there that will do that kind of gap analysis for your markets to tell you, in terms of supply and demand, these are the other places you probably should be looking for that kind of talent. Uh, unfortunately, most of the good ones have a cost. Uh, things like Talent Neuron and LinkedIn Talent Insights, SeekOut, HireTool, they all have that kind of um, people analytics functionality. Uh, but if you don't have that, you could still do a rough kind of search on the free version of LinkedIn where you enter the skill, use that site colon linkedin.com slash in search that we were talking about. Um, put in the location, put in one specific location that you're not, haven't looked at yet. So it'll give you an, an estimate of how many profiles there are in that location and then compare it to the other city areas that you're looking at and see which ones have greater numbers of what you're looking for. Yeah, that's uh, that's also really a great tip. Um, oh, and yeah. I think it's great that uh, Jennifer just mentioned we should have a webinar on talent intelligence. Well, you know what? I'm about to do that very topic at Sourcing Summit Virtual, uh, which is all happening this week. That's another big yeah. uh, sourcing conference. So I'm literally jumping off this webinar to go join there. And that is our topic today. So hopefully you can view the recording if you can't see it live. That's amazing. What time is it, Glenn, actually, your presentation? Uh, it is literally starts in 50 minutes from now. Amazing. I'll see you there. And uh, the hackathon starts in <laughs> one hour and 50 minutes. <laughs> um, quick review. Um, I'm just checking if we have any more questions. Can you provide a link to that webinar? Uh, it's source assignment virtual. We can send you the link. uh marta i think that uh there will be recordings available after that but uh, 
Yeah. Just check it out. Cool. Yeah, it's okay. a great event. Thank you. It is definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank so you, much. guys. See you next Thursday on our next workshop with Balash. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Teddy, for your time. Uh, yes, it was have, a pleasure. Have a great day. Have a great week, evening. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you for everyone. joining. Thank you all. Thank you.